In a quite satisfying gesture, she had copied from the human. She'd answered while opening her lips way more than was necessary. Well, if you seriously think this could get you in trouble, I can't let you bury it all in your own now, can I? Whatever they would have to tell her surely had to be interesting. Although they were a bit too trusting about the whole thing, if it could theoretically have actual consequences. Curie shifted their legs, bringing their body even closer towards Shida, while gesturing for her to also come closer with their short arms. Shida did as she was told and leaned in towards Curie's face, turning her head sideways and her ear towards the small person. Shifting uncomfortably and fiddling with their hands, Curie began to explain, having adjusted their volume to be no louder than a whisper, but overall much clearer. I will tell you the truth. I do not think what happened was unavoidable, and I think the people who are currently in control of my laboratory are not being truthful. She didn't quite know what to make of this. It was true that the incident had been quite strange, and of course she herself had long since come to the conclusion it must have been caused on purpose, so of course it was not unavoidable. But what do they mean by the investigators not being truthful? What makes you think that? She inquired quietly, shooting them a conspiratorial glance. I have tried to figure it out, and much as I tried, I could not come to another conclusion. Their soft voice explained nervously, and she'd imagine them wildly glancing around, if they only had eyes to do so. I do not know why they would do it, but it is not reasonable to figure that they could not find the source of an explosion of such a magnitude. While she didn't know if that was true, she was intrigued. The tiny inventor usually knew what they were talking about, mostly since they rarely talked about something they didn't have an absolute abundance of knowledge about. But she felt there was more to their reasoning. Well, let's give them the benefit of the doubt here. Wouldn't it be possible that it has been something put together specifically to be undetectable? Or maybe they actually just overlooked something, as unfortunate as that would be, she whispered back at them. Curie shifted their body to make a gesture similar to shaking their head. Not impossible, but unreasonable. I have figured something similar and offered multiple times to take a look at the findings myself. I designed the system, and I am confident that I could detect even minor alterations. But, ever since the incident, I have been declined access to my laboratory, they further stated. Shida shrugged, suggesting, Maybe they didn't want you to possibly alter evidence. You said it yourself. Due to the impossible circumstances of the incident, I am resolved of all suspicion. Also, they have already stopped searching for evidence despite my protests, and... They claim, stopping short at the end of their sentence. Shida's ears stood up straight. And? She pried, invigorated. Curie paused for a few more seconds, halted by some invisible barrier. Then they said to themselves, their hands stopping to fiddle and instead clenching into tiny fists. With a steady voice, they said... And any device used for generating an explosion of such proportions, short of using actual explosives, which would leave preposterously easy to find traces, can reasonably be expected to be unthinkable to make disappear without someone noticing. Unless... And suddenly it dawned on Shida what they were proposing. Unless no one is around to witness it, right? She finished curious suspicion and began to wave her tail excitedly while her grin got wider. So, you are thinking they sealed the thing off and shut you out so you wouldn't find whatever was used to blow the thing up, and so they could get rid of it without anyone bothering them. Did I get that right? A moment they were quiet, then Curie firmly stated, I think I figured it out. Shida let their statement sit for a moment, looking at them with a mixture of curiosity and amusement. Then she pushed herself back with her hands, rolled onto her back, and then catapulted herself onto her feet. Curie had to dodge her sudden movement, and now slowly turned, constantly facing Shida's stride through the room. Shida was slowly circling the mechanic, softly smiling at them, and waving her tail while keeping eye contact with their lifeless red eyes. Well, if you figured it out, what's the plan now? You didn't just tell me all of this for no reason, did you? She challenged them mischievously. It took Curie noticeably more effort to turn on the spot than it took Shida to prance around them their many legs erratically clanking on the lab's hard floor with each hectic movement. I figured the reasonable path of action would be to somehow gain access to my laboratory as long as they still have it on lockdown, as I figured that 
Even if it has been weeks since the incident, they would not keep it sealed and further deny me access if they had already cleared out the traces of what truthfully happened, they explained, managing quite well to keep the oncoming nervousness of their voice to a minimum. But you haven't figured out how, she demolts lightly, folding her hands behind her head. Curie confirmed with a nod. I figured I cannot reason with them, so the reasonable solution for me would be to be sneaky about it, they professed, never breaking line of sight with Shida. But, unfortunately, I have no proficiency in such activities. And you figured I would obviously have such proficiency, Shida reckoned warily. I figured, as an officer, you might have the authority to grant me entrance so that I wouldn't have to actually rely on that solution, Curie stated obliviously. Oh, Shida said, suddenly stopping in her tracks and losing her bravado, staring at Curie for a moment before dully answering. Well, no, um... Sorry, I don't. Curie seemed disappointed for a moment. She'd quickly waved her hand reassuringly to stop them from giving up too quickly, after she had finally gotten something engaging out of them. Well, maybe I don't have the authority to get you in there, she quickly spluttered. But I do know how to get into places I'm not supposed to be. Curie stared at her for a moment. Are you offering to help me sneak into my laboratory? They asked cluelessly, rhythmically bending both sides of their legs. Wouldn't that get you in trouble? Shida took a deep breath, trying hard to look and sound reassuring. Well, what you said does make sense. If that damn explosion is going to make so many problems for me, you better believe I want it investigated properly. She exclaimed energetically, before shrugging with open hands and casually adding. Despite, I'll only get in trouble if people find out about it, which would go against the whole being sneaky thing anyway. So yeah, I think I can get you in there. For some time, Curie seemed to process what Shida had just told them. Then they suddenly scurried over to Shida with unexpected speed, getting uncomfortably close, but not actually touching her. That's great! They yelled out excitedly. Thank you, thank you, thank you! Shida stepped back, waving her hands defensively. Hey, no problem, she stammered awkwardly, caught off guard. Anything for Pal! Curie once again stopped for a moment, their red, beady eyes staring uncertainly without focus. Yeah, they said quietly. That's right. They excitedly made their way through the room and towards the gate, while Shida looked after them, half befuddled, half amused. They got about halfway before realising they were moving alone, stopping in their tracks and turning, presumably to see what was keeping Shida, who would be musically cross her arms and look back at them with a sly smile. And just where do you think you're going? She asked the excited inventor, staring back at her. My laboratory! Aren't we going right now? Curie responded with honest confusion in their voice that reminded Shida of a kitten that got so excited for a trip that the thought of even waiting to put shoes on beforehand sounded preposterous to them. And she had to think about that for a moment. Usually a bit of planning would have been in order, but what could they actually plan? The security in the room was sparse. She had only ever seen one guard standing at the door, which wasn't surprising considering the only people on board were part of the crew, and therefore it wasn't too likely someone would try to break in. Not to mention that some destroyed laboratory probably wasn't too interesting for most people. Well, we can't just go in there and barge in, Shida told them ruminatively, stepping over towards one of the room's walls and turning her back to it, taking in the rest of the room. Or what did you think being sneaky about it means? If they were back on Dunima, she would of course suggest waiting for the cover of night to do anything in secret, but they were on board of a spaceship, and the people guarding the room would most likely follow the usual shift system. So there would neither be tired guards, nor any darkness to keep them shrouded, so now really was as good a time as any to do it. Despite, she was bored anyway. She studied the room they were in for a moment. Curious lab would have about the same layout as James's after all. It only had one door and that would be guarded, so unless they somehow found a miraculous distraction, that was out. But if there was another way in, they would also find it here. You know the lads better than I do. Any idea how he might get in there without having to go straight through the guard? She asked Curie dismissively, while scanning the walls. In most other wings of the ship, she would have some ideas of getting around, but the research area had never really interested her too much, seeing as she never had any business up here until recently. Curie seemed to ponder her request, their metal body unnevertheless staying still as a statue, while they were thinking. 
The research wing is designed so that the different laboratories do not interfere with nor endanger each other or the rest of the ship, with possible accidents in each one of them. So the different laboratories are pretty much isolated, they so he began to state. I am guessing that means the air vents are out of the question. She did suppose, while looking at the grids welded in place at regular intervals on the upper parts of the walls, as well as the ceiling. They are. The filters in place are designed to even keep out the smallest impurities and would not allow us any way of passage, explained Curie. She decided to walk back and forth while thinking, and she and Curie went back and forth for a short while, with her making suggestions and Curie shutting them down. No extra entrances, no outside access points for maintenance, neither for electronics nor for water. Absolutely no holes, nooks or crannies to squeeze in through. Sign irritated, she just shook her hair out of her face. So he started to ponder if they could somehow lure the guard away without giving away who was trying to get into the room, as she began to surrender to the fact that, to them, the room was pretty much impenetrable short of breaking down the wall. Or maybe she would just have to give up on this little entertainment project of hers. Frustratedly, she haphazardly let herself fall backwards, landing on the ground hard, causing a long thud to echo under her in the low rumble. Then she halted and snapped to attention, a memory creeping into her mind. Maybe the laboratories were designed to be these isolated impregnable boxes, but they weren't dealing with just any laboratory, were they? She sat herself up, thoughtfully knocking onto the floor with her fist, repeating the echoing sound under her feet. Say, the explosion of fire did quite a bit of damage to your lab, didn't they? She contemplatively asked, while the sound rung through her ears, jumping around between the hull of the ship and the floor of the room underneath them. They said it was even close to damaging the hull, isn't that right? That is right, Curie confirmed, cautiously awaiting Sheeta's next proposal. The realisation hit Sheeta hard, and she smiled as she had cracked the code. Maybe they couldn't break open the lab right next to a guard, but they didn't have to. It had already been opened. The hole they couldn't find in this laboratory was there in the other one, provided directly by the very mystery they were trying to uncover itself, and burns neatly straight through the lab's floor. With Curie in tow, it took Sheeta a good bit longer than she expected to reach from the research the mechanics wing. Stopping for a moment, Sheeta casually leaned against the wall next to a big, nondescript door. While leaning down, she looked over to Curie, who had stopped behind her and now looked at her confusedly. Every passing crew member shot them a poorly disguised stare. Being the talk of the ship at the moment really didn't help with going unnoticed. Why have you stopped? Curie suddenly asked out loud. Sheeta had to suppress her urge to flinch onto their outburst, trying to keep her appearance as casual as possible, or signaling Curie to be quiet. Is there a problem with your plan? They responded to her gesture, completely ignoring it in the process. She shot them an annoyed glance. There was a problem indeed, and it just wouldn't keep quiet. The stares of the people passing by got longer and more intently. She had to think, and quick. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work like this. She replied, letting only a small amount of her annoyance out from her voice. I think we may need to rethink our approach here. Curie was taken by surprise. But you said you had a plan. You appear to be so sure of it, Curie said perplexed, and she was thankful that they seemed to at least have the awareness to not speak about their objective out loud. Well, I was, Sheeta answered, feigning discomfort at her supposed confession. But, now that we're here, it just now somewhat dawned on me what we are actually trying to do. Her words did miss their mark. Curie seemed to be completely taken aback, and she could by now basically feel the looks of curiosity on her skin. Some people had even stopped what they were doing in order to gawk at the two of them seemingly arguing. But, you said you were going to help me. You said it wouldn't be a problem, Curie said, not agitated like she'd had imagined, but with a singing calm disappointment that filled even Sheeta's stomach with a faint, dull feeling. Taking a deep breath, she responded, Yeah, and I was really going to, really, it's just that... Before letting her voice trail off and seemingly coincidentally, letting her gaze wander over towards the group of people staring at them by now, who hastily averted their eyes, trying to seem like they hadn't just been shamelessly gawking at the drama. Look, right here is not the place, she then continued, looking back at Curie apologetically. She then turned and quickly opened the door they were standing next to, gesturing inside the dimly lit room. Let's talk this out with some privacy, okay? Curie hesitated for a moment, but was slowly doing as they had been told and skulking into the room, closely followed by Shida, who closed the door behind them. 
That would hopefully give the damn pair something to gossip about, without tuning them into what they were doing. The moment she was sure the door had closed shut, Shida turned to Kiri, annoyedly blurting out, You know, being sneaky is usually done quietly. What was that about just now? Kiri stood petrified at her sudden raise in volume. I don't understand, they said. Didn't you want to tell me what problem there is with your plan? They really were completely oblivious. The problem, Shida growled slowly, is that you nearly blew our cover before the plan has even started. She tried to control her breathing, while Kiri seemingly struggled to cope with the situation they found themselves in, once more starting to slowly sway left and right where they stood. But you said they tried to defend themselves, but Shida wouldn't have any of it. I was trying to find us an inn, she interrupted them, pacing up and down as she ranted. Everyone on the ship knows who we are, so we better damn be careful, because if it comes out that somebody broke into your laboratory and we are even an inch out of place where that happens, we will be found out in no time. Irritated, she rubbed her eyes, making a few more lines up and down the small room while trying to quell her aggravation. All the while, Curie was following her with their gaze, now radiating an aura of unease. But didn't you just say you could not go on with it? Curie further asked confusedly. I was lying. Shida blared out, putting emphasis on each syllable. Putting on an act so these idiots out there would have something to speculate over, instead of thinking about what we are actually doing here, after you had so expertly pulled all their damn attention towards us. Curie stood quiet for a moment. When you told me of your plan, why didn't you explain any of this? They asked, their synthetic voice unable to quiver, yet somehow still communicating their misery. I didn't think I'd have to. Shida barked, stopping and turning towards them with crossed arms. It's just common sense. But looking at Curie made her pause. Their posture was completely different now. It was hard to see in the dark room, but in the middle of their giant legs, their small, black body hung, cowered together, their forward limbs pressed tightly to their torso, forming a sort of fetal position while looking at the ground. Her anger ebbed away while looking at their pitiful figure, and she felt the muscles of her face and arms relax. A fire of memory flashed through her mind. She could almost see the tiny form before her in her eye, curling up and pressing down on her ears to drown out the world around her. I am sorry, Curie glumly stated, without lifting their face. I know that I often do not appear sensible. I am no good at many things that come natural to most people. I never meant to cause you any offence. Shida slowly let out a long, heavy breath through her nose. Well, it doesn't matter now, she mumbled dismissively, the numb feeling returning to her stomach. But for both our sakes, try to keep quiet, unless I ask you something from now on, okay? Curie nodded slowly and stood quiet, as Sheeta went over to the very reason they were in this room in the first place, bending down to a small hatch in the ground and opening it, revealing a number pad underneath it. She quickly put in the general override code she had memorized so well by now that she could have typed it in blind. Next to her, a bigger hatch that had been nearly invisible beforehand loosened from the floor panels, popping up with a slight hiss. Shida grabbed the latch and propped it completely open, allowing vision inside the nearly pitch black void. Then, while sitting down on the edge of the trap door and staring into the darkness, Shida sighed softly and added passingly, And I'll try to remember explaining everything that needs to be done beforehand. And, quiet as a shadow, she slipped down into the darkness. In the meantime, far away from his friends trying to remain unseen, James had a very different problem. He pressed himself against the wall of the ship, just behind a corner, and looked back the way he had just come. His eyes strained while scanning across all the crew members still populating the hallway. What had started as a weird gut feeling at first had turned into a certainty over time, and it had only intensified more and more since the incident in Curie's laboratory. And if his instinct was anything to go by, those things were probably connected. Luckily, whoever was following him may not have been an amateur, but they weren't exactly a professional either. They were extraordinary at concealing themselves, to a point where even he had not yet been able to actually spot them, but they also allowed themselves to be figured out pretty easily and left other ways to track and notice them wide open. And today, he had felt like it was time to start putting the knowledge he had acquired to some use. The first thing he had learned was how to lure them out, it was easy enough, he just had to be out and about without his assistant for an extended amount of time. 
Today's dinner plans had pretty much played into that perfectly, so right now, he was waiting for them to finally make their move. Unfortunately for now, the only eyes he could feel upon himself were those of Moore, Quiss and Pippa, all of whom were looking at him with a mix of concern and amusement. I am still not quite sure what you are trying to accomplish, Moore commented. Other than him, she was not pressed against the wall, is just standing tall a few more metres into the hallway, away from the corner. Her comment earned her approving gestures from their other crewmates. I told you, I need to know what I am dealing with, James answered, still peering around the corner. For now, I just want to try and get one good look. After that, we'll just have to stick to the plan. And you're sure there's something to get a look at? Pippa chimed in, stepping closer and poking her head around the corner, right above his head. Hey, watch it! James yelled out and shot around, pushing against Pippa's massive frame, forcing her backwards and away from the corner. What if they see you? Pippa didn't seem too pleased about being moved so indignantly, and gave him a very disapproving look. Pippa is right, you know. I don't understand how you can be so sure of something you have no indications for. Moore said, and combed along the fur of her arms with her claws. Call it instinct, James retorted half dismissive, while manoeuvring himself back into his position at the wall. Besides, no indications is a bit harsh, don't you think? His companions swelled to meaningful looks with each other. After a few seconds of silent contemplation, Moe's eyes came to rest on Moore, who let out a soft sigh. Gently, she stepped over to him, and lowered one of her massive claws onto his shoulder. James, I know you really believe that you are being followed, she stated with a worried undertone. But from just what you told us, it is hard to come to the same conclusion. It all sounds so... Insane. Pippa finished more sentence for her, while still regarding James with a look of hurt pride. Moore huffed at that, shooting Pippa a disapproving look without taking her hand off of James's soldier. I was going to say, hard to believe. She corrected her, and then turned back to James, lowering her head a bit closer to him. However, it does sound like all of this has taken a toll on you. The first time in a spaceship is hard on the mind in the first place, and combining that with all that has happened to you already. James let out a long breath, and pulled himself away from the corner, turning to face his crewmates. Instead of pressing up against the wall, he now opted to casually lean against it. He also let his head fall backwards so that the back of it sobbed slammed against the wall with a dull thudding noise. I am fine, he emphasised. I'm not going to pretend the past weeks weren't exhausting, but I am nowhere close to losing my mind. All in all, college finals are more stressful than this. But why would anyone be following you in the first place? Pippa pried. Using the opportunity to skulk past him again, she put her head back around the corner. Not bothering to stop her again, James simply looked over at her back and answered. Well, that's one of the things I'm trying to find out. I have some ideas, but none of them really make sense, considering they watched me even before all this started. And yet you are sure this and the events in Curie's laboratory are connected? Moore inquired, not dropping that worried tone of hers. It would be a wild coincidence if they weren't, don't you think? James replied, gently brushing Moore's claw off of his shoulder and pushing himself off the wall, in order to step back over to Pippa. I mean, it sounds hard enough to believe that crew members follow me around and sabotage Curie's lab in the first place, but those things happening around the same time completely coincidentally? I don't think so. Wait, sabotage? Who said anything about sabotage? Pippa chimed up and turned around towards him. Wasn't the whole thing an accident? Moore swayed her giant head in agreement. The investigation was unconclusive as to what caused the explosion, and therefore it was chalked up to have been an unforeseen mechanical failure, she confirmed. James rubbed his eyes and had to hold an annoying sound back from leaving his lips. Oh, my sweet summer children, he lamented, while looking up at them. They can hardly go around saying that they were sabotaged when they were the ones who sabotaged it. Wait, now you're saying it was Command who blew the thing up? Pippa exclaimed agitatedly, causing James to quickly shush her with his finger before his mouth. Before answering, he glanced around at the other people loitering in the hall, making sure no one was getting too interested in their conversation. Luckily, people seemed to be quite a lot less interested in him, while he wasn't hanging out with either Shida or Curie. Calming down a bit, he replied, Well, either them or someone they specifically want to protect. 
and since it's most likely also one of them that's following me, I am going with the first option for now. Pippa, who seemed less and less enthused with what James had to say, chimed in once more. And how did you get that idea? Instinct again? This time James could not stop an annoyed sound from escaping his lips. I already told you, whoever they are, they shot when I don't have my assistant with me, he explained, and started pacing a bit in front of Pippa. Meaning they most likely don't need to follow me around when I have it with me. And why do you think is that? He stopped his pacing and looked Pippa dead in the eye. By now, she could hold eye contact with him well enough, so, for a moment, it evolved into an impromptu staring contest, which also allowed James to see that she wasn't really thinking about what he had just said. By now, he couldn't even blame her, because, as upset as he was with her, she probably was just as upset at him. And by experience, each of them was as thick-headed as the other. I am still not sure I see the connection. Moore stepped into the conversation once more, breaking the two of them up for just a moment. It was just enough for James to regain his focus on the situation at hand. Now more annoyed at himself than a pipper for snapping like that, he shook his head to clear his mind. His hand reached for his forehead, and he supported himself like that for a few seconds before taking a deep breath and looking back up at Moore. Come on guys, you're smarter than this, he said with only a hint of disappointment, but a lot more honesty in his voice. They clearly want to keep tabs on me, that's why I'm being followed. However, they don't need to follow me around when I have my assistant with me. They also don't watch me in my cabin or my lab all the time, yet they are fully aware when I leave without wearing my assistant. He really didn't want to spell it out any further. It really wasn't rocket science. Hell, they probably would have figured out rocket science faster than this. At least this time, he finally saw those big brains of his colleagues working behind their eyes. With one look above his head, he realised that Quiss had already understood what he wanted to tell them, but they weren't speaking up. Instead, they looked lost in thoughts all of their own. Moore and Pippa, however, seemed a bit more reluctant to accept the reality he was trying to sell them, mulling the information over a few times. The computer system, Moore finally concluded. You're saying they're getting a fix on your position, Pippa continued. Now they were getting somewhere. Bingo, James exclaimed with a snap of his fingers. They know exactly where I am, and presumably what I am doing, as long as I am either wearing my assistant or standing near a screen of the board computer. Like a cow when there's lightning. That's how his mother would have described the faces of his crewmates when it finally clicked for them. Or maybe like a deer in headlights was more fitting. They stood for a moment with blank stares and open mouths, apparently surprised at what had come out of their own mouths. But how did you figure that out? How did you even get the idea? Moore asked, dumbfounded. It's what I would have done, so it was the first thing I thought of. I just had to make sure my hunch was right, and when they followed me whenever I expected them to, I knew I had them figured out, James explained, now reinvigorated and going back to watching the hall behind them for a moment. Looking around the corner, there was no sign of anything suspicious yet. Even though all kinds of people were using the hallway as always, he had yet to find what he was waiting for. Having apparently snapped out of her anger just as much as him by now, Pippa slowly seemed to adapt to the situation, getting back her typical energy. But wait, isn't it more likely that they've just been hacked? She reckoned, and with that, contributed about the smartest thing that had been said this entire conversation. James paused for a moment before answering, thinking it over one more time. I have considered it, he responded slowly, almost hesitatingly, and his grip on the wall tightened. And it's certainly not impossible, but all in all, that would still leave the events as sheer coincidences and an entire party unaccounted for, so as long as I don't find a reason to think otherwise, I'll stick to the Occam's razor for now. He had to admit to himself. Deep down, he hoped that he was wrong. The what? Pippa inquired indignantly. James shook his head. The maximum parsimony principle, he corrected, wondering how he had switched to Earthlingo without even noticing. Choosing the easiest explanation as long as there's no evidence suggesting otherwise. Moore clarified his statement, as Pippa's look of confusion had not vanished from her face. But I still feel you may be biking bark and expecting sap here. Is it not a bit too simple of an approach for a suggestion of this... severity? James was about to turn around and explain himself once more, when a sound gave him pause. A clanking sound coming from just above his head caused him to look up. Moore and Pippa also fixed their gazes on the origin of the sound. In an attempt to gain their attention, 
Quiz had banged their tail against the wall, causing the scales to grattle and grind against each other. A moment after the impact, they shook themselves for a moment. The sound, as always, giving James goosebumps. Apparently they wished to have something to add to this conversation. I fear we should trust James with this, they signed, not pausing for a moment between each movement, having apparently chosen their words very carefully before. He has probably thought about this long and hard. I don't think he would be making such accusations lightly. Moore seemed to wish to make a retort, but Quiz stopped her with a surprisingly firm gesture, signaling they weren't finished yet. It also seems to me like James has more experience with these kind of things than any of us, possibly even all of us combined, making him the expert in this situation, meaning just maybe we should not write off what he is telling us because we do not like it, they continued, their face unmoving, yet somehow still emanating an aura of certainty that hit all of them like a freight train. Even James stood before them, dumbfounded, and could not muster more of a response than, uh, thanks, Quiz. He was really glad that someone had his back. He just didn't expect this. Quiz turns, now focusing their attention onto him, and once more shook themselves, rattling their scales. Don't worry about it, they signed, suddenly putting on a much more casual appearance than James was used to from them. However, I have one question as well. With that, they looked at James expectantly. Guessing it was what they wanted, he acknowledged them with a nod of the head and listened carefully. Quiz nodded back and continued. Why did you ask us for help with this? It pains me to admit it, but as you have probably noticed, we aren't exactly made for this kind of thing. And I can't help but feel that your usual accomplices would have been a much greater help in your situation. So why not ask them? The thought didn't seem to have occurred to the other two, who now looked at James with the same expecting look Quiz was giving him. James laughed to himself guiltily. You're starting to ask the right questions, I'm proud of you, he said, with a grim smile on his face, his right hand instinctively reaching for the five scars on his left arm. It's complicated. It's not like I want to keep it from them, or that I don't want their help, but I really can't get them involved for now. His sentiment gained him some unbelieving looks from his crewmates, as he paused for a moment to gather his thoughts for an explanation. Well, as much for help as Sheeda would be, she is also an officer working for the exact people I'm trying to uncover here. And while I don't think she's involved, I sadly just can't be sure of that right now. He started while avoiding eye contact with everyone, only finally looking back up at his colleagues as he laughingly added. And, not to sound mean, but Curie couldn't keep a secret to save their life. And I mean that quite literally. Silence followed, broken by the footsteps and murmuring of other nearby crew members. The first one to speak up was Moore. This really has been on your mind for a long time, has it not? The old woman asked with a tone that couldn't sound more motherly. Even out of an alien throat, it was a tone James recognised all too well, and it stirred up some bad memories. Of course he couldn't fault Moore for that, who clearly only had his best in mind right now. So he answered through clenched teeth, swallowing his dark thoughts. Yeah, but it's okay. I've been through worse. Like clockwork, he added in the back of his mind. Some of his emotions must have still been visible in his face though, because nearly synchronously, Moore and Pippa took a step towards him, each reaching out one of their arms. He reached out with his hands to grab the reassuring arms of his friends, one resting on each of his shoulders. He felt that warmth flowing into him from the tips of his fingers, and just for a second, he closed his eyes just enjoyed the moment of contact between them. Well, maybe we are much help, but if you're actually serious about this, we'll damn well help out, Pippa declared, softly bouncing in place while holding on to him. This is something that needs to be cleared up, no matter if you are right in your perception or not, Moore agreed, shaking her big head side to side, so that the matted fur of her neck flew around wildly. James couldn't help but let out a small relief chuckle at the innocent enthusiasm of his friends. Then he looked above his head once more, where Chris was still standing. Now he was more thankful than ever that they had stood up for him. Although he could never quite read them, he felt like their still face was still not cleared of the concern and thoughtfulness he had felt on it before. But the hands mini signed an OK as they nodded their big head towards him, so maybe he was just imagining it. It was as if a burden would lift it from his shoulders. Something within him, as ancient as humanity itself, lifted him up, as he felt the support of his peers and his pack instincts were kicking in. The endorphins flooded his brain, now overclocked him into overdrive, and his thirst for action rose sky high, making him jittery and sharpening his senses to the extreme. For once in his life, the timing could not have been better, because only moments later, his ears detected something, and his brain rang alarm. This time it wasn't his lizard brain, 
which he had so often diligently warned him about his persecutor and brought him onto their traits in the first place. No. This time it was a part of his brain he was all too familiar with. A part he had been training and honing for a big part of his life for all his personal interests as well as for his work. And foremost of all, a part that was most decidedly human. Unlike his eyes, his hearing wasn't anything to write home about. He could hear well enough, but it wasn't anything extraordinary. In fact, the ship's atmosphere was one his ears were not designed for, meaning he probably heard worse than many other crew members instead of better. And yet, of everyone present, he was sure he was the only one who could even notice that sound amongst the cacophony of noises. Or rather, the sounds. A pattern of sounds, in fact. Two feet, hitting the floor almost at the same time, but not quite, leaned to two thumping sounds that followed one another very closely. The first sets were light and most likely didn't stem from a large person, but the abrupt sound indicated the entire mass hitting the ground at the same time, creating an image of a skipping motion in his mind. And between each skip there was a pause, about half a second when they were walking, and only a third of that when they were running. A pattern indeed. And a pattern is something that can't get past a human, especially not one that he had made a specific effort to remember, and remember well. His grin must have gotten wider, because his new partners in crime pulled away their hands and looked at him expectantly. What is it now? Pippa asked, her bouncing in place getting more erratic by the second. Moore asked the same question with her gaze alone. James stood up straight, interlocking the fingers of his hands with each other and stretching out his arms, causing the muscles, joints and ligaments in them to crack and pop. Then he stepped over to the corner one last time, pressing up against the wall again and casually glancing into the hall. The corners of his mouth rose into a smirk as he answered. Now? Now is showtime. <laughs>